Hey, Ronnie. Hey, Lou. Hey, you know, we listened to a lot of music growing up through the 60s and 70s and yeah. even into the 80s. That's no lie. But for sure, that period between 60s and 70s. Best music in the world. And some of the most iconic album covers of all time. Yep. So today on the show, we're going to share some of those with you. And we're going to hope that you comment and give us your feelings and suggestions on this episode of Men Are So Smart called The Most Iconic Album Covers of All Time Next. Hi there, welcome to another episode of Men Are So Smart. We are so happy you're here. I'm Lou Gallagher. Corvette Ronnie. And today we're talking about music, one of our favorite topics. That's what I live for. Uh, and not so much the music on the record itself, but the album cover is what we're talking about. When you look at the cover of the album, you should know exactly how it sounds. It may seem like an odd conundrum, but the artwork of a record can often, whether subconsciously or explicitly, affect one's experience with the music within. Topics like this are meant to inspire healthy debate. So let's dive into this list of the most iconic albums of all time and find out how they came to be and why they remain hallmarks of any music lover's collection, Ronnie. Okay, this first one, uh -huh. uh, it's The Freewheelin' Bob Dylan. Oh, there it is, right 1963. there. 1963. Mm -hmm. uh, there had been great album covers prior to the release of Dylan's sophomore effort, but The Freewheelin' Bob Dylan ushered in a new intimate aesthetic that was markedly different than what had come before. Yeah. Uh, here's Dylan uh, with then-girlfriend Susie Rotello walking down the corner of Jones Street and West Forth in New York's city, uh, New York City's West Village. Looks cold. During a brisk, cold day. Yeah. Yep. Uh, Rotello is clutching onto Dylan's arm. And this was captured by staff photographer Don Hunstein. The image revealed in its casual romance something that informed legendary songs like Don't Think Twice, It's All Right. It sounds like this. <laughs> Pretty much they all sound like that. They do. <laughs> uh, and also, of course, Freewheeling. Yeah. It's remembered for its numerous political minded numbers. But this album cover still showed that the underneath all his intellect, Bob Dylan was still a human. Barely. Even Tom Cruise and Cameron Crowe tried recreating it in their 2000 film, Vanilla Sky, with questionable success. Did you see that movie? I did not see that I movie. I didn't see it. No. How about the Beatles' White Album? You go, well, White Album? How much creativity could be in that? <laughs> it's kind of well, true. you could easily populate this list with numerous Beatles album covers. And one of the most iconic is the gloriously overstuffed pop art moment that was Sgt. Pepper, helmed by Peter Blake and Jan Hayworth. While various artworks were commissioned for the band's ninth studio effort, it was Richard Hamilton who effectively convinced uh, Paul Mack and the rest of the fellas to pull off this daring middle finger moment to the music world, <laughs> having gone from colorful extravagance to stark, striking minimalism with the band's name in Helvetica and ever so slightly off alignment. This album cover, so dismissed as a joke upon its first reveal, showed that the Beatles, at the height of their powers, could truly do anything they wanted. What's more, this self-titled record, only later dubbed the White Album for obvious reasons, was weirdly evocative of the music contained within. While the cover for Sgt. Pepper alluded to a psychedelic panoply of songs, Boy, this our author really likes to uh, use the SAT test, doesn't he? <laughs> the blank canvas the Fab Four provided us for this epic meant that they could truly traverse into any subgenre they wanted, often inventing new ones along the way. Country, heavy metal, reggae, nothing was off limits. And this cover so deceptively simple advertised that there were no limits to what lies beneath. That's kind of an interesting statement there. They're just saying, you know what? In your face. It, take it for what it is. It's the music within. Yep. I I have to tell you, I was a gigantic Beatles fan. Still am. Mm -hmm. my, my favorite band of all time. Uh, but when I saw the White Album, I was a little disappointed. Really? It, uh, it's so different. I have, I have several old albums. I have the first two that they released in the United States where they are kind of like 
faces. Mm -hmm. In one of them, there's the four of them standing together. And in the second one, it's just little like face shots of all of them. Uh, and so to see this, and then, I mean, like the White Album, Abbey Road, those are iconics and uh, in and of themselves. But this was like, it's white. Yeah. I don't get it. Well, I remember at that time, I was looking for all the clues that Paul was dead. Yes. And, you know, Sgt. <laughs> yeah. Pepper had so many on that cover. Right. And then they followed up with a white album. It was like, uh, what? They're all dead. <laughs> <laughs> what? They're all dead inside, for sure. All right, next up, uh, Led Zeppelin. Led Zeppelin. Oh, self-entitled, right. Self-entitled, mm -hmm. uh, The which has a picture of the Hindenburg on it. The Hindenburg disaster from 1937 remains one of humanity's more distinct tragedies. But after a joke from the Who's Keith Moon about a potential supergroup going over like a Led Zeppelin, the already iconic photo of the famed airship blowing up as taken by Sam Shear made perfect sense for the UK band's raucous debut album. The design of the cover proper was done by George Hardy and remains a phallic icon of sweaty, Horn dog rock and roll. Uh, was it too perverse for some? Honestly, I hadn't really even gone there. A whole I'd, lot of love. I never. On. Well, that, but I hadn't thought about the album cover as uh -huh. the. I just saw it as the Hindenburg. So, um, let's see. Uh, was it too perverse for some? Certainly, but it captured the fury, humor, and power of Led Zeppelin's blues-inspired sound perfectly. I think it did. Uh, aristocrat and descendant Eva von Zeppelin apparently wasn't a fan, once threatening legal action over the group's name. Please. Nowadays, anyone mentioning Zeppelin in a conversation conjures up an image of an exploding airship with some groundbreaking rock songs to go along with it. You need schooling. Baby, <laughs> I ain't fooling. <laughs> you know, if somebody just says Zeppelin to me, yeah. nothing, nothing from the Hindenburg comes to no. mind. I th I think I think of, Jimmy Page. I think Jimmy Page, Robert Plant. Right. Uh, yeah. It's uh, and again, you know, in another show, a previous show, I, I was talking about albums that scared me as a kid because I was so naive <laughs> and innocent, um, and I led a sheltered life as a Catholic boy. Uh, I was afraid of those bands. You know, I remember when I first heard once uh, a whole lot of loving through a stereo system with four speakers. All of that music oh, going wow. around in a circle like this, it was like it almost made you dizzy going from speaker to speaker. They really were doing a lot more with uh, in the production of yeah. music back then. Yeah, but you know that guitar was still always raw. Oh, God, yeah. Uh, on our list of the most iconic album covers of all time, the Beatles show up again with Abbey Road from 1969 while Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band remained a pop art fantasia. And the White Album was a whiplash into deliberate minimalism. There is arguably no record more instantly memorable or iconic than the Beatles' Abbey Road. Photographed by Ian McMillan, outside the famed recording studio of the same name, I've walked across that very same crosswalk. Have right you there. really? Yes, I have. I have a picture of it. This legendary cover shows the band walking in unison, but with their own identities firmly established. John, with his shaggy beard and hands in his pocket, Paul strolling barefoot with a cigarette in hand, George in jeans while the rest don Tommy Nutter suits, it all fit perfectly. It's meta in its reference to the band's internal dynamics. Note how everyone is strolling with the left foot forward, except for Paul. A clue. Dry. Mired in artistic meaning while capturing the fashion and attitude of the era in a single perfect moment, so often imitated, but never bettered. No. Absolutely. And that Volkswagen right there in the back. Yep. Yep. It's an iconic shot. It absolutely is. I uh, I love that picture, that album cover. Okay, this next one. Somebody mentioned it in our live show. Yeah. That they thought it would be on there. It's on there. It's on there. I wish I knew who, who it was that mentioned it. Uh, it's from the Rolling Stones, Sticky Fingers. Yep. Uh, I'm glad yep. you got this line. <laughs> yep, that's a penis. <laughs> Thank you, Ron. <laughs> uh, while Sticky Fingers is notable for featuring the first use of the iconic Tongue and Lips logo, which now is on every Worldwide. concert shirt they sell. Yeah. Um, uh, you see, the, that cover image was, to many at the time, downright shocking. The zipper worked. <laughs> I'll bet uh, 
a perfect representation of the stones at the peak of their powers, indeed. Uh, sleazy and intriguing at the same time, this ambitious progressive cover was conceived by Andy Warhol, of course. who else? Uh, Lens by Billy Name, Name mm -hmm. probably, and designed by Craig Brown. Uh, in fact, this cover was so assured to be the talk of the town that a real-life zipper was crafted onto the sleeves of the initial release. I remember that. How much do you think that cost them to do that? Uh, yeah. The only problem, when the vinyl is laid on top of each other and the zipper was puncturing the vinyl on the album right above it, uh -huh. retailers and consumers began complaining. Meetings were held as to how to solve it. And then someone came up with the genius idea of just unzipping the records before they were stacked. Huh. Okay. I don't know. I, uh, I don't trans know. Transgressive at the time, the cover of Sticky Fingers pushed the limits of what was acceptable for record releases. And despite some protest, actually got away with it. Yeah. Uh, they got away with a lot of stuff. They did. <laughs> they were the Rolling Stones. They still are. Yeah, they were the dirty boy version of the Beatles. They were, yeah, you were either... You, at the time, you could either be Beatles or Stones, but, but you, you couldn't be both. No, you're absolutely right, yeah. Ronnie. Iconic album covers of all time. Next, we have Pink Floyd, Dark Side of the Moon. One can't talk about iconic album covers without talking about Pink Floyd. And since we're talking about Pink Floyd, we're talking about Storm Thorgerson. For the uninitiated, Thorgerson had his hand in record covers that were both eye-catching and unapologetically Thorgerson. While he is known whoops, while he is known for doing the designs for Peter Gabriel's early solo albums, Wings, The Mollusk, and artists like Paul McCartney, Led Zeppelin, The Mars Volta, and Genesis, he is still best known and remembered as the man who gave Pink Floyd its distinct visual identity. While Thorgerson and Aubrey Powell, who later formed the design firm Hypnosis, had been long-standing Floyd collaborators, the band insisted something simple might be done for its eighth LP, The Dark Side of the Moon. Initially frustrated, but soon later overcoming the challenge, the simple prism conceived of for the cover told you everything you needed to know about the psychedelic experience waiting inside for you. It's simple to the point of genius and helped color the perceptions of the tens of millions of people who bought it, like me, eventually going down as one of the best-selling records of all time. I, I think right there, that is probably one of the most recognizable pictures in all of music. I agree with you. I think you could show that picture to anybody older than... 30 years old, and they would know exactly what album, what the name of that yeah, album Yeah, you wouldn't even need to have the album or the band name on it. They'd look at the prism and know. Right. Yeah. Uh, this next one, also pretty iconic. This is me. one of my favorite albums. Yeah, and it's, a, and it's a great album full of unbelievably great music. Mm -hmm. uh, Asia by Steely Dan, yep. uh, which I still love. Their uh, music is amazing. Walter Becker. Walter Becker, Donald Fagan are no strangers to distinctive album sleeves from the charming nostalgia of Pretzel Logic to the pop art explosion that is their debut effort, Can't Buy a Thrill. Yet when the boys fully committed to jazz fusion for Asia, it ended up serving as their calling card. Mm -hmm. Primarily black with careful hints of white and red, photographer Hideki Fuji caught model Sokyo Yamaguchi in a variety of poses. But the white and red hints on her garment in the take chosen by the album art provides a distinct striking symmetry. Uh, advertisements at the time referred to Asia as a place in your mind. That's actually a pretty good representation. Yeah. Uh, and when you glance at the cover of the record proper, it's hard not to be transported there. You not know, a great album cover. That was like, I remember that in my first year of college. Um, I had that playing in my little convertible all the time on an eight track. <laughs> yeah, I said it, an eight track. <laughs> All right, uh, just a couple more here, I think. Uh, Bruce Springsteen, born in the USA, 1984. That was the first year I got into radio. I remember playing these songs. In a 2009 interview with Rolling Stone magazine, the boss revealed why his butt graces the cover of his most popular album. It's his best side. Uh, <laughs> we took a lot of different types of pictures, and in the end, pardon the pun, 
a picture of my ass looked better than the picture of my face. That's why it went on the cover, Springsteen said. <laughs> While he has always been associated as a man who wrote anthems for the working class, this photograph, wonderfully captured by Annie Leibovitz, showed Springsteen in jeans with a baseball cap stuffed in his back pocket, all while standing in front of the bars of an American flag, perhaps unintentionally nodding as the exact inverse of the Rolling Stones' sticky fingers, this denim-clad posterior was simply leading you to Springsteen's most considered and popular record, representing the fact that you might already look the part of someone living the American dream. Okay, this last one? Yep. Yeah. And I love this album. This is a really good album. Uh, it's Nirvana. It's uh, from the album Nevermind from 1991. Uh-huh. And as soon as you see this picture, it is, oh, yeah. it's in very many ways iconic. Uh, in some ways, the cover for Nevermind is kind of an ob it's kind of obvious. It's a baby swimming toward a dollar bill from a fishing hook. That happens every day. Yeah. Uh, although this dig towards the more materialistic-minded aspects of capitalism may come off as simple to some, it certainly didn't come off as simple to any of the millions of people who ended up buying this album. Me among them. Uh, given that Nevermind in tandem with Pearl Jam's 10 uh, is considered ground zero for the modern grunge movement. For sure. The way this sleeve acknowledged how we all buy into the rat race and are victims of it at the same time genuinely resonated with people and helped uh, color in Kurt Cobain's lyrics about alienation surprisingly well. Conceived, uh, conceived of by Cobain and Geffen Records art director Robert Fisher and photographed by Kirk Weddle, Nevermind went on to become a generation touchstone and all for good reason. Yeah, that's, uh, uh, these are probably just 10 maybe of the most iconic album covers of all time. There certainly are many, many more and you may have some one or two that we weren't able to get to today. Yeah. So we'd love to have you comment below. Uh, Ronnie and I are really pretty good about getting back to you when you comment. Absolutely. We appreciate your time. If you took the time to bang out a message, and we really want to get back to you uh, because we appreciate it. We truly do. Uh, our website, you've seen that running across the bottom of the screen. It's menaresosmart.com. We are on Facebook at Men Are So Smart. And our email address is Ronnie. Uh, Ronnie at menaresosmart.com. And mine is Lou, L-O-U, at menaresosmart.com. Why do you feel the need to spell Lou, but I don't have to spell Ronnie? I don't know, because Lou could be spelled L-E-W. I suppose. L-U. Ronnie could be R-O-N-N-Y. Some people call me Low Gallagher. <laughs> I think that's apropos. What about just L-U? L-A-L-U. I actually worked with a woman who went by Lou, L-U. Uh-huh. So... All right, there you have it. Throwing that wraps it up our episode today. We hope you've enjoyed. Uh, I'm Lou Gallagher. Corvette Ronnie. We'll see you on the next Men Are So Smart. <laughs>